everyone. I am Kimberly, the 5-Minute NP. The 5-Minute NP was born out of my belief that small, incremental changes can drastically change the trajectory of your life. Our genes do not have to determine our lifespan. My goal through this podcast is to act as a roadmap that bridges the gap between knowledge and action, leading to you living your healthiest, happiest, longest life. Welcome to the 5-Minute NP Podcast. Hello, happy you're here for this episode of the 5-Minute NP Podcast with Dr. Christopher Berg, who is a medical doctor who specializes in aging and longevity. He is also the CSO and co-founder of the nutraceutical company, Novo Slabs and a partner of the Million Dollar Longevity Fund that invests in new technologies to address aging. He wrote his first science book at the age of 16, and by age 28, he had written four science books, including The Longevity Code. At the University of Brussels, he researches and also teaches about longevity. In this interview, he discusses why it seems all living things weaken and die with age, and why he feels we no longer have to. He shares how much of aging is genetic and how much we can do something about. He talks about the known mechanisms of aging and why he feels epigenetics is the most important one. He spends a good amount of time talking about the significance of omega-3s, what type to get, the differences, and what to stay away from. He provides the key things to focus on with the longevity diet, the longevity lifestyle, and when it is crucial to start implementing these anti-aging interventions. I learned so much from this discussion and I know you will too. Thank you for being here. And remember, like, share, and subscribe to the podcast. My goal is truly to help you live your happiest, healthiest, longest life by learning how small incremental daily changes can lead to real life health impact. Welcome to the 5-Minute MP Podcast. All right. Welcome, Dr. Fredberg. Uh, Thank you for being here. Looking so forward to this conversation today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So I just want to find out more about you, what you've been doing, your background and your interest in longevity. Yeah. Since a young age, I've been fascinated by why we have to age, why we have to grow old and why our lifespan is just around 80 years or so. Um, So I was always wondering why does aging exist? Uh, Because in nature, there are some animals or organisms that don't seem to age or that have much longer lifespans. You have like sharks that can grow 400, 500 years old. You have some small little cute polyps that uh, don't seem to age and that are called uh, immortal in the sense that, yeah, generation uh, or let's say year after year, they don't really show any signs of aging, uh, which is very remarkable. So uh, you have some trees that can grow thousands of years old um so why is our lifespan only 80 years old? and um so that's one of my big interests and i always have been interested in uh, medicine in general so that's why i uh, studied for medicine and became a doctor i was fascinated by the human body and also the brain especially consciousness and so on um, but yeah if you study the human body the first thing or one of the first things you ask yourself is why does that body have to age and decline and eventually die and how can we slow down this process and i also quickly realized uh, during my studies that the best way to keep people healthy is to slow down aging itself because most diseases we get like heart disease alzheimer's disease cancer osteoarthritis osteoporosis all these diseases are fundamentally caused by aging. Uh, If you eat unhealthy or you don't exercise, you will uh, accelerate these fundamental aging processes. But in the end, we will sooner or later die. And and, uh, yeah, that's because of aging. And if we better understand why we age, we can postpone, uh, yeah, let's say that inexorable decline of our health. Um, and, and it's the best way to keep people healthy for the longest time is by just acting on, on aging itself. So that are some reasons why I'm so interested uh, in aging. Yeah. And you've written actually four books on the subject, correct? Yeah, well, I've written indeed four books. My last two books were indeed about aging, longevity and health. The first two books, uh, they are more about science and philosophy. Uh, So I wrote my first science book when I was 16 years old. And uh, then my second science book was when I was 21 years old and studying medicine. And I still had so much time at the university. I I wrote another book of 500 pages about science and using scientific insights to answer big questions. 
like uh, where did the universe come from what's consciousness what's life how did life arise and uh, and so on so trying to use science to shed some light on on big uh, interesting questions um and then my last two books uh, including the longevity code uh, that's my uh, last last book i uh, i delve deeper into health aging longevity using the viewpoint of aging to give, in my opinion, better advice than uh, a lot of currently circulating advice because there is so much contradicting uh, advice about health and longevity and diets. But if you approach all these topics from aging, you can much better see the long-term effects of, of your health recommendations. Uh, so it really helps to much better assess what's the best diet or what are the best foods to live longer. And these are foods or diets that slow down aging. Wow, that's great. And that's impressive. 16 years old to write a science book. That's amazing. Um, I was going to ask you a little later, but I'm just going to ask now, as far as your last book, The Longevity Code, that was a what 2018. What has I mean, that's a little bit of time in this field. Uh, what do you feel has changed in regards to the science of longevity and aging since you wrote that last book? Yeah, well, we have seen uh, a lot of interesting changes. Um, I think the broad lines of the books are, are still uh, very valuable. Um, but I think one thing I saw is a lot of uh, corroboration or verification of what I was saying already many years ago, uh, like the, the best diets and so on. Uh, so that was good to see that we, in the, lo uh, in the years after my book came out, we had further, uh, let's say, uh, corroboration of, of the things I mentioned. Uh, already a long time ago, but uh, a lot of things also further improved and changed. Uh, we have seen in the last couple of years more and more studies showing that it's possible to partially reverse aging. So uh, we, see, we see studies where you can make old organisms young again. Uh, for example, you have old mice with gray fur and bald spots and they have uh, osteoarthritis and osteoporosis and so on. And then, for example, you epigenetically reprogram these mice and they become younger again. So the gray fur becomes shiny black again and these mice are much more active and their organs and tissues regenerate much better as if they were young again. Um, and we have seen more and more studies in the last couple of years coming out, demonstrating that it's not just possible to slow down aging, but to actually reverse the aging process. And that's a whole other, let's say, ball game in the sense that, uh, yeah, for the last decades, we were always thinking about ways to just slow it down. But if you can reverse it, that would be the same as having an 80-year-old human and making that person 40 years or 30 years again. Um, and that's where we need to go. And in the last few months, uh, we have seen a lot of, uh, let's say over the last one, two years, we have seen a lot of investment into companies that want to reverse aging or go that, or that want to go out the root cause of aging. Uh, one case in point is Altos Labs, which was uh, uh, funded uh, a few months ago, uh, and they received $3 billion in funding um, to reverse the aging process and, uh, and in that way to mitigate multiple aging-related diseases at the same time. Um, so I, I think also in the last couple of years, we have seen more uh, interest in general in, in tackling aging from both pharmaceutical industry, medical doctors are gradually, uh, let's say, opening up to the idea that the best way to keep people healthy is addressing aging. For a lot of doctors, aging is something natural, uh, something that you don't have to treat. Also, a lot of doctors are not really trained in aging. If you ask them, why do we age? They will say something like, oh, we age because of DNA damage and that's it. But we know now much more about aging. And um, But we see that more and more doctors start to realize that the best way to keep people healthy for the longest time is going at the root cause of all these diseases the, they eventually get, and that's uh, that's a, uh, addressing aging itself. So there's also a shift, um, yeah. And I think about nutrition, we see more and more studies that look, yeah, at that specific diets and longevity diets. Uh, so not just diets to improve health, but also diets to improve longevity. So we have also seen uh, some interesting papers and, and large studies coming out there too. Wow, it's so interesting. Well, when we talk about you know. Um, reversing the aging process, possibly. Um, what is at stake in this human effort to overcome the aging process from a biological standpoint? Like, are we playing God in some way? I mean, is aging sort of a natural selection process? 
Yeah, that's a great question. Huh? So why does aging exist in the first place? Uh, mm -hmm. So um, that was actually a big riddle for, uh, for a very long time. Uh, so scientists really wondered why does aging exist? Because some people say we age because we uh, wear out uh, because of the wear and tear of, of just being and, and the, that wear and tear eventually gets you, right? it kills you eventually. But that's not really the case because nature can really slow down that wear and tear a lot. Um, so you have like uh, sharks that can live 500 years and they don't have osteoarthritis or cancer or Alzheimer's disease when they are 90 years old, like we have. Uh, yeah. And, and uh, the opposite is also true. We have mice. They only live two, for two years. And they get cancer when they, when they are 1.5 years old. Uh, and we get cancer when we are 60 or 70 years old. So it shows that nature can slow down the, let's say, the, the risk of cancer or uh, substantially. In mice, it's much faster than in humans. And in, and in whales, uh, they, are, uh, they get cancer when they are 200 years old. So it really shows that nature can really postpone all these diseases uh, very well. Uh, so it's not just wear and, uh, wear and tear and, and the wearing down of, of the tissues. Um, so why do we wear down so fast uh, compared to whales or, or some Greenland sharks that live for hundreds of years? Um, well, the reason is that in prehistoric times, uh, there was no use for humans to become thousand years old because mostly people died very quickly. Uh, they lived for 30, 40 years because they died of external causes of death. Mm -hmm. uh, so they were killed by a predator. They fell into a ravine. They were killed by diseases. Mm -hmm. uh, they died of starvation. So um, there was no use to create a body that could live for hundreds of years if you were killed before age 40. Uh, um, so that explains why uh, nature made our bodies to do quite well for about 30 years or so after uh, we uh, had, so we had just enough chance to reproduce and uh, or assist in the reproduction. And after that, um, we, yeah, we are just left to our own devices and uh, uh, the body is not maintained anymore after age 30 or 40. And we gradually start to age and, and wear down, uh, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. You can also compare it to mice. Um, um, the mice, like I mentioned, live on average for two years in, in captivity, but um, there is no reason for mice to uh, make them uh, as such that they would live for 20 years. Why? Because 90% of mice die before age of one year mm -hmm. because they are killed, they are eaten, they die of the cold and, and, uh, and so on. Um, so they die of external causes of death. So there's no use for evolution or other processes to make mice that can grow 20 years old because 99% of mice are, are dead before age two. Um, so that explains why mice age very quickly because they are not maintained for a very long time because there was no use because they died of external causes of death. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason actually why aging exists. So aging actually exists because aging didn't really uh, occur in prehistoric times. You didn't have the time to grow old because mostly at age 30 or 40, you were dead. You uh, and uh, so there was no selection pressure to really make us hundreds of years uh, old uh, mm -hmm. because uh, we most uh, the chance would be very, very small we could survive for that long. That also explains why some species live much longer than us. Mm -hmm. Take, for example, some turtles. Some turtles can become 200 years old uh, and even pr probably older. Uh, why? Because they have a shield. Uh, they are protected. They have a shell. Uh, and that protects them against natural predators. So every mutation that caused the turtle to live longer and longer was useful because a turtle could actually stick around for 200 years in nature because it was so well protected by its specific shell. The same also for whales. Uh, whales have very little natural predators because they are so big, so they are protected by their size. So that explains why some Greenland whales can grow 200 years old. Uh, and the same for bats. Uh, bats look a lot like mice, uh, but they can live up to 40 years, so 20 times longer than normal mice. Uh, why? Because they have wings so they can fly away from danger 
and they have echolocation, so they can find food much better than mice, so they can survive much better in nature, and that uh, selected for much longer lifespans. Um, so to come back to your question, uh, should we play for God? Um, that's a good question. I think the best way to keep people healthy is by addressing the root cause of, of the, the all those aging-related diseases we get. Uh, Alzheimer's disease, it's, it's, it's a terrible disease. Uh, osteoarthritis, it's, it's a very cumbersome disease, and, and so on. So there is a lot of suffering caused by these aging-related diseases. Mm -hmm. And the best way to uh, treat those diseases is by going at the root cause, which is aging itself. So I think uh, eventually we will find uh, uh, treatments for aging because it's, it's such a good way to keep people healthy. Yeah. Yeah. That is such great information. How much is aging? How much of aging is genetic? I know a lot so, changed with that whole, like, okay, it's pre-programmed. This is what you got, but that's not really the case anymore. Um, from what I'm understanding, how much do you feel is genetic versus how much difference we can make through our lifestyles? That's a great question. So there are a lot of misconceptions about that question. So I will do my best to answer it as accurately as possible. So, of course, aging is mainly genetic. Eh? So the, if you look at the average lifespan of humans, it's about around 80 years. And the maximum lifespan of humans is around 120 years. Right? So that's inscribed in our genes. Uh, but that doesn't mean uh, that you can't do anything about your lifespan, eh? far from it. So the variation uh, in the duration of your lifespan is about 75% determined by your lifestyle and about 25% genetic. Uh, so, uh, so I'm perhaps contradicting myself here a little bit when I just said aging is mainly genetic. Of course, everything is genetic. Mm -hmm. uh, so... But if you look at the variation of, of uh, lifespans, uh, so why do, does one person become 80 years old, another person only 65 years? So that variation in our lifespan is 75% determined by our lifestyle and 25% only by genetics. Uh, um, so, so it's very important to eat healthy, to sleep well, to exercise, to have a positive mindset. We can talk about that later uh, because a large uh, portion, proportion of the variation of our individual lifespan is determined by lifestyle. But that's only the case for, let's say, most people. Uh, uh, but if you look at people who become very, very old, we call them centenarians. Mm -hmm. So these are people who become 100 years or older. For those exceptional people, we see it's mainly genetic. Uh, genetics that uh, plays a role in their very long lifespan. Mm -hmm. So that also explains why some people who become 105 years old, uh, they smoke or they eat very unhealthy they eat, uh, or they drink soda the whole day. And then people are say, saying, yeah, look at this centenarian. Uh, she's smoking and she's eating hamburgers and she became 100 years old. Uh, so And then people conclude, like, I don't have to mind my food because you see yeah, it's it's uh, just uh, genetics mainly. Uh, uh, or to say lifestyle is not important uh, because you see this person is smoking and she's 100 years old. But yeah, I would not uh, do that. I would not draw that conclusion because centenarians, they, they are they mainly have very good protective genes uh, mm -hmm. and you also see it it runs in families so if uh, if your uh, uh, mother or father is 100 years old uh, or older uh, you have 10 times more a chance of also becoming uh, very very old um, so but for 99.9 percent .9 of the population that are not blessed by these very protective genes uh, that have normal lifespans of around 80 years uh, for for those people for you and me it's very important to eat healthy and to adhere to a lifestyle because that's 75%. Uh, did, um, it plays for 75% a role in our lifespan uh, variation. Yeah, yeah. Well, I know human beings, we've been dreaming of finding a cure for aging for a long time. Do you feel like we have found some of those keys? Yeah, we are starting to find them. Uh, like you said, eh, for thousands of years, we've been looking for the fountain of youth or for an elixir that can reverse or slow down aging. Mm -hmm. um, but now things are different. Eh? We learned so much about aging. We learned more about aging the last 10 years than the thousand years before that. Um, we discovered the DNA and how proteins work in the last 50, 60 years. Um, we are also at the start of a new biotech revolution with all kinds of novel 
novel therapies that are uh, currently being devised and that are very promising, like gene editing and so on. Um, so times are now different. And I think for the first time in human history, we will be able to really use novel technologies to uh, yeah, reprogram our own aging process. And we are finally getting the tools uh, to do so. Uh, so previously in medicine, we had very blunt instruments mm -hmm. like small molecules, uh, drugs that uh, often act everywhere in the body and have a lot of side effects and so on. But in the last few years, we discovered much sharper or more precise tools like gene editing and transcriptomic treatments and epigenetic treatments and so on uh, that in the next years and decades really will enable doctors and scientists in general um, to uh, yeah, tweak how our body works. And that's going to be very interesting. And um, we, we have seen in recent studies that it's possible to reverse aging. Um, and yeah, all kinds of companies are now being created around this, uh, including spin-offs from Harvard University that's uh, looking into epigenetic reprogramming to reverse aging. Uh, they had some great studies published uh, about rejuvenation of the damaged eye nerve um, and other studies like at Stanford, uh, where there is also a company looking into methods to rejuvenate or uh, um, uh, reprogram the aging process to treat uh, joint uh, problems. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, and I just spoke about Altos, the company that got $3 billion in funding to also uh, devise ways to reverse aging. And actually, even Google uh, is realizing that the best way to keep people healthy is acting on aging and reversing it. So mm -hmm. Google or Alphabet created a company uh, called Calico, and they also got billions in funding um, to also uh, reverse aging or, or uh, yeah, really find novel treatments to act on aging. So I think the next years and decades going, are going to be very interesting. And I think it's very important to eat healthy and to have a healthy lifespan so you can stay around long enough, uh, stay alive long enough to profit from these new biotechnologies that uh, come, will come to fruition in the next years and decades. Yeah, yeah, that is so cool. How much longer do you actually feel from this, from where we are right now? How long do you feel is actually possible to extend one, one's lifespan? I mean, like months, years, what, what do you think? Yeah, if you can reverse aging, um, yeah, there is there would be almost no limits. Huh? Uh, so in, in that sense, right, if you can make an 80-year-old person look like 40 or 30 years, uh, yeah, actually, that, that's the golden, let's say, uh, key um, to unlock that potential. Uh, so reversing aging, that, that's the, the goal. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult to say. Uh, so I, I, I'm always careful with making predictions, but yeah. you have some people and scientists saying, yeah, that's, that it will, we will go to a future where people live for, will live for 200 years or 300 years and still look as if they are 30 or 40 years old. Uh, um, so you have other scientists that are more subdued and that will say, uh, yeah, we will substantially extend lifespan. So you can expect in the next 100 years, that lifespan will, a lot of people will become 100 years and it will be very normal. So uh, actually, if you just look at the statistics, we actually know today, a child born today will uh, have, has a little bit more than 50% chance of becoming on average 105 years old. Wow. So, so that's, and that's not taking into, uh, into account all these new technologies I just discussed. Uh, so if you just look at the statistics and actually every decade we live longer. Uh, so every decade we get about 2.5 years extra of lifespan. Uh, mm -hmm. um, so that's very interesting. Um, so it means that after a few decades and also taking into account some novel technologies, but not even reversing aging. Uh, yeah, a lot of scientists and uh, statistici statisticians, they um, predict that a uh, child born today will have around 50% chance of becoming 105 years old. Um, and, and then you have some scientists who are more like negative. They say, no, lifespan, it's 120 years max, and that's it. But those scientists, they don't take into account novel technologies that will be able to reverse aging and so on. Um, wow. So I think it's very likely we will go towards a future where people yeah, will live for 200 years or uh, 150 years, still look young, and will yeah, really have the best of, of their health, uh, can really 
live up to their uh, maximum lifespan potential or maximum health potential over a very long time. And some philosophers and scientists are even speculating about that kind of future. Uh, mm -hmm. So how will we organize our work and our pensions uh, and our investments and so on if we are going to become 150 years old? Uh, so some philosophers say we will go from a three-stage life towards a multi-stage life. Uh, so currently, uh, people have a three-stage life. Uh, so you uh, you have an education, then you work, and then you go on retirement. Uh, but if people will become 150 years old or 200 years old, that will be different. They will perhaps lead a multi-stage life, which means they will have an education, they will work for 10 years or so, um, then they go on a micro-retirement for a few years, and after that, they follow a novel kind of education. And then uh, they do that job, a completely different job for 10 years or 15 years. And then they go again on micro retirement and then get a new education and so on. So you have a multi-stage life um, and it will be different Christmas parties. Eh? There will be grandparents and grand grandparents and, uh, and people who are like 100 years old and still look like 40 years old. So uh, some scientists speculate we go towards an ageless society. So where you cannot really see your age anymore uh, uh, by looking at the face of people because all these new treatments yeah, rejuvenate their faces always. So they are perhaps 90 years old, but they look much, much younger. Uh, so uh, that's what's being called an ageless society in, in that regard. So I think it's likely we will go uh, towards that uh, that kind of society, yeah. Wow, it would seem like we maybe would be get overpopulated or something if we all live that long. Yeah, that's uh, an argument that's often raised. Um, actually, I think it's less of a problem than uh, many people think. Um, they are right. In the short term, there will be over uh, there will be more population. But if you look in the long term, very likely there won't be overpopulation. Actually, there will be underpopulation, and that's even a big problem. So let me explain a little bit more in detail. So the next hundred years, we will definitely see population growth for from from about seven billion now to around nine billion um, uh, in the next hundred years. But after that, the population will decline very likely. Um, and some people speculate that in 300 years from now, there will be 90% less Europeans, for example, 90% uh, less Germans, Spaniards, and, and so on, because um, people just have less and less uh, children uh, and, and so on. So um, th that's, and some scientists really worry about this uh, population implosion that we will see manifest in the long term. So, uh, mm -hmm. uh, so in the short term next 100 years yeah there will be uh, about 2 billion extra people uh, on uh, on earth compared to to today but if you look in hundreds of years from now then uh, underpopulation could really be a problem and uh, some scientists even worry that uh, we can go extinct that way uh, because uh, yeah if you look at uh, many hundreds of years of now uh, the we, the population could decline so much that perhaps we can go extinct. And it would not be the first time because there was also another species besides us, uh, Homo sapiens. There was the Neanderthal who lived together with humans and they got extinct about 30,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, probably uh, there are many reasons or explanations put forward, but one uh, interesting explanation is that they just uh, had two little children and they just uh, uh, sizzled out compared to uh, our species. Um, mm -hmm. So, and uh, some people say, yeah, but underpopulation is that even possible? Because if you look at other countries, perhaps uh, there there's still a, uh, there are still a lot of children being born, mm -hmm. but actually not really. If you look at the global uh, birth rate, uh, you see it's about 2.3 children per woman, uh, mm -hmm. taking into account all countries, which is very little because you need around 2.1 children per woman uh, to maintain the population uh, because not everyone has children and so on. So the, the average birth, global birth rate of uh, 2.3 or so, 2.4, is very close to 2.1 already. And if you look at Singapore, for example, the average birth rate is only one child per couple. Uh, mm -hmm. And in many European countries and so on is the case. And, uh, and in a lot uh, of developing countries, the birth rate declined significantly the last uh, 30, 40 years. Mm -hmm. So a lot of scientists worry actually about underpopulation in the long term. And I think longevity technologies that can extend lifespan uh, could be interesting um, mm -hmm. uh, in that sense to ward off or at least delay that uh, that long-term uh, scenario of underpopulation. 
Wow. Interesting. Yeah. I didn't think about that. I didn't realize that. Um, how do we know these longevity efforts are working? I mean, is it through biological clocks or how do we determine this, what these efforts are, are working? Yeah, that's a great question. So currently we, we don't have that good biomarkers of aging yet. Uh, so it's very difficult to really measure someone's biological age. Uh, we can look at their face. Uh, some people look older than their age or younger. Uh, we can look at their blood, uh, looking at cholesterol and inflammation. But these are all very crude methods of assess in a holistic way your biological age. Mm -hmm. But there is light on the horizon. So in the last few years, a lot of interesting novel methods or biomarkers of aging are currently uh, being developed. Mm -hmm. And uh, one very well known are epigenetic clocks. Uh, so these are clocks that uh, try to determine your biological age by looking at your epigenome. And the epigenome is the complicated machinery that surrounds the DNA and that determines which genes are active or inactive. Um, so it's very funny, actually. You know, we have hundreds of different cells. Uh, we have brain cells, we have muscle cells, we have liver cells, but all these cells have the same DNA. So why is, a cell a, uh, why is one cell a brain cell and another cell a muscle cell if they have the same DNA? Uh, they have 3 billion base pairs as DNA. Mm -hmm. The reason is the epigenome. So the epigenome uh, switches on liver genes in liver cells and switches off heart genes in, in liver cells. And uh, the epigenome switch on, uh, switch on um, skin genes in skin cells so that the skin cell becomes a skin cell and so on. The problem is when we get older, that epigenetic uh, mechanism gets uh, awry. So it, it, it's, it becomes uh, destabilized and, and so on. That's one of the reasons why we age, by the way, epigenetic dysregulation. So you have uh, pro-cancer genes switched on, which increases our risk of cancer when we get older. You have housekeeping genes that are switched off by the epigenome that increase our risk of uh, yeah all kinds of aging-related diseases because the cells don't maintain themselves and so on. But you can actually look at the DNA and see, look at methylation. Uh, so methylation are small molecules that put on the DNA. And if the DNA is covered by a lot of these methyl groups, these small molecules, mm -hmm. then these genes are silenced. Uh, so actually epigenetic clocks look at these methyl groups on the DNA, the pattern of the methyl groups on the DNA to assess your biological age. Um, and that way you can uh, yeah, assess how healthy uh, someone really is or their mortality risk. Uh, for example, a person can be 50 years old chronologically, but if that person eats unhealthy and doesn't exercise and is stressed and has sleep deprivation, perhaps that person is uh, biologically uh, 58 years old. Uh, so eight years older biologically than their chronological age. Mm -hmm. And if they are eight years older bi biologically by measurement of this epigenetic clock, uh, they have double the risk of dying uh, compared to someone who would be uh, biologically 50 years old uh, and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and also chronologically 50 years old. And the opposite is also true. If you eat very healthy and exercise, perhaps you're 50 years old, but biologically you're 43 years old. So that's what these epigenetic clocks try to measure. Mm -hmm. You have all kinds of different clocks in development and we looked into all of them and uh, some of them are very interesting. Some clocks look more at mort uh, general mortality. Other clocks look more at disease, uh, your risk of Alzheimer's and, and other aging related diseases. Um, so that's a very interesting kind of clock. But uh, there are also other clocks in development. Um, so there are clocks that look at the blood, uh, that look at multiple biomarkers of your blood to assess your biological age. Uh, you have clocks that look at the microbiome. So these are the bacteria in your gut or even in your mouth that can also uh, be correlated to your risk of dying and, and, uh, and lifespan. Uh, so, uh, so it's actually very interesting. Some clocks that look at the oral microbiome, so the bacteria in your mouth, they are sometimes more accurate than the microbiome clocks that look at the bacteria in your gut. Uh, and we know that an unhealthy mouth, uh, there, if there are a lot of bad bacteria in your mouth, they leak into the bloodstream and they can cause inflammation in the, in the heart and in the brain and in the, in the blood vessels and so on. So anyway, um, and there are other clocks in development uh, that look at uh, the proteome. Uh, so they look at the proteins that are active in the cells uh, or at the transcriptome. So they look at uh, uh, RNA in the cells and so on. So I think the clock of the future 
the aging clock of the future will be a clock that looks at all these things at the same time. So it will be a clock that combines the microbiome, uh, the epigenome, the transcriptome, uh, the proteome, the metabolome, uh, the lipidome, and so on, to really get a good picture of your overall health, your longevity, and lifespan. Wow. Wow, that is incredible. Well, real quick, the oral microbiome or the, you know, the oral biome, is there anything else we should be doing to protect it? That's a pretty big indicator other than flossing and brushing. I mean, is there anything else we need to know? Yeah, well, the, the two things you already mentioned, the two most important things. So I really would floss every day. Uh, it's very important. Uh, I do it every day. And uh, brushing also, I would buy an electric toothbrush. Uh, because it, it does the brushing so much better than when you do it just manually. Uh, um, and um, I would be careful with uh, mouth water. So uh, because you have to, uh, because it's often very antiseptic uh, and these mouthwashes, they can kill the good bacteria also in your mouth. Mm -hmm. So I would be careful with uh, these uh, mouthwashes. Uh, and um, um, yeah, in general, I would also make sure you take good supplements, which are also important for teeth health. Uh, um, so like uh, making sure you take enough calcium. Uh, if you don't drink milk, I don't really ad advise to drink milk because milk very likely accelerates aging in the long term. But that's another story. Mm -hmm. I can talk about uh, for hours about milk and aging. But anyway, so uh, but if you don't drink milk, I would definitely take calcium supplements. Uh, you can say, yeah, I can get calcium from my green leafy vegetables like broccoli and and. Mm -hmm. and and so on. Uh, but it's, it's very difficult to get enough calcium. So I, I take, for example, uh, two times 500 milligrams of calcium in the morning and the evening um, every day together with vitamin D and vitamin K, uh, which make sure that the calcium is taken up. So you need vitamin D for that. And vitamin K is also very important because it makes sure that the calcium ends up in the teeth and in the bones mm -hmm. uh, and not in the blood vessel wall, uh, where the calcium can calcify the blood vessel wall. Uh, so it's very important important to take enough vitamin K. Um, so I think calcium, vitamin D, vitamin K are also important for oral health uh, mm -hmm. and good teeth, um, and strong teeth in general. And uh, yeah, I, I think uh, these are some, uh, and uh, like I mentioned, flossing electric toothbrushes, uh, these are great ways uh, to improve your oral uh, microbiome. Mm -hmm. What form of calcium do you take and what brand? I mean, I think it's, there's so many different things nowadays. I'm going to write this down. What brand do you recommend or what, you know, what type of calcium? Yeah. So about calcium, there are different types, but uh, for calcium, it's, it's less important which type. Um, okay. So in that regard, it's more important for magnesium. Uh, there it's important to take okay. not magnesium oxide uh, or magnesium citrate even. Ideally, you take magnesium malate, eh? magnesium glycinate, because malate and glycinate uh, also uh, extend lifespan. Uh, okay. It's one of, our, of the ingredients we put in, in novels, uh, our science-based nutraceutical we created. Um, so I would opt for magnesium malate and uh, magnesium glycinate. But for calcium, it's less important uh, um, in, in that regard, uh, because all, all forms of calcium are very uh, well absorbed. Uh, um, okay. So what's, what is very important for calcium, nonetheless, is to take not too much calcium at once. So if you take more than 1,000 milligrams or 1,200 milligrams in one go, uh, the, 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 it's possible you have a too high calcium peak in the blood that can uh, uh, contribute to calcification of the arteries. Okay. So I would always take uh, around 500 milligrams of calcium per day, at least less than 1,000 milligrams uh, in one go. So not 500 milligrams per day. I mean, 500 milligrams each day, twice per day. Uh, so uh, 500 milligrams in the morning or 500 milligrams in the evening. Um, and, and not 1,000 milligrams in one go. Okay. With food or... Yeah, well, um, you can take it with food. Uh, it's important to take the calcium separately from iron okay. um, because uh, iron uh, and calcium, they don't go well together because calcium inhibits the absorption of iron. Um, so that's something to be mindful about. Uh, but in, in general, yeah, you can take the calcium after uh, your breakfast or after lunch, uh, for example, or before you go to bed, because calcium also uh, calms down the nervous system. It's a more an inhibitory substance. And uh, yeah, some people take 500 milligrams before they go to bed uh, to sleep better. And actually on our website on novoslabs.com, we have an article that uh, lists 50 tips to sleep better. And one of them is to take calcium before bedtime, 500 milligrams, uh, together with magnesium. Ideally, magnesium glycinate, 
because magnesium also calms down the mind and the glycinate also uh, calms down the mind. And if you then uh, use um, tea, especially uh, so relaxing tea like chamomile tea, uh, you have to be careful with green tea and other teas because they contain caffeine. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called tea in, uh, tea in uh, but it's uh, uh, it's important to make sure uh, you take, uh, yeah, like a herbal tea that relaxes mm -hmm. like chamomile, which also has shown to extend lifespan. Uh, mm -hmm. Chamomile tea is very healthy and you can uh, use that and to uh, take your calcium and magnesium uh, to improve your sleep, for example. How much magnesium, like why is magnesium so important and how much do we need? Yeah, magnesium is very important for uh, so many uh, things in the body. Uh, so uh, it's it's a cofactor of hundreds of enzymes and proteins in the body. They need magnesium to function properly, uh, these proteins and enzymes and so on. Um, uh, another interesting thing about magnesium is it stabilizes the DNA mm -hmm. and it can reduce DNA damage. Uh, so it's, uh, it, it binds a little bit to DNA uh, and uh, it hangs around DNA and uh, it can uh, stabilize it and, and reduce the risk of mutations and so on. Um, so magnesium is definitely very important for health. Um, there are studies showing that people who take magnesium, they have better heart health, um, they have a better metabolism and uh, less DNA damage and so on. Uh, how much per day? Yeah, I, ideally around 300 milligrams, 400 milligrams per day. Yeah, so uh, even 500 milligrams uh, spread uh, out uh, over two different doses, so not at once. Uh, so yeah, that, uh, that's, that's a, a good way to go about it. Um, and ideally magnesium malate uh, or magnesium glycinate because these forms are well absorbed. And uh, as I mentioned before, malate and glycinate or gly glycine uh, can extend uh, uh, lifespan. Mm -hmm. With the vitamin D and the K2, is that something you take in the morning with your calcium? Uh, yeah, well, I have a very complicated supplement regimen. So, uh, so I think um, I, I take my calcium separately from the stuff I take in the morning because, uh, for example, I take in the morning iron and I don't want the calcium to interfere with the absorption of iron and some other minerals. So often I take my, uh, just a calcium tablet in the afternoon uh, and then before I go to bed uh, to improve my sleep. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, but if people don't take iron in the morning or specific minerals, um, then they can take calcium, uh, 500 milligrams, uh, and then they can take it uh, before they go to bed, uh, the other 500 milligrams. Yeah. Okay. Um, I didn't realize we were supposed to be supplementing with iron. I thought there was some detriments of supplementing with iron. No. Uh, yes, yes and no. So uh, iron is a very interesting topic. Um, so we see that iron, it can oxidize a lot of surrounding molecules. Uh, um, and uh, we also see that iron can play a role in aging uh, uh, because it can damage proteins and, and uh, neurotransmitters like dopamine, and, and uh, which can contribute perhaps to Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease and so on. So um, iron, it's like a, a two-edged uh, sword. You have to re be very careful with it. But on the other hand, we see a lot of people are deficient in iron, especially women. Um, they often the people are uh, tired the whole time, and uh, often, yeah, it's iron deficiency. And it's not that, uh, yeah, you can measure it in the blood. But I, I've also written a whole article about uh, the reliability of blood tests. Uh, so you have to be very skeptical about them uh, because for most people, the blood test is normal, but still they can be deficient in all kinds of vitamins and minerals uh, because the blood tests they're not very accurate accurate methods to really yeah. measure deficiencies. It's a big problem. Um, so a lot of people say, well, my blood test was okay, so I'm okay. Well, far from it, really very far from it. But yeah. anyway. um, So with iron, uh, yeah, you can measure it in the blood. So you can look at ferritin and transferrin and iron binding capacity. Uh, but still, uh, even then, uh, you're uh, you have to be, uh, let's say, skeptical and, and um, sometimes just test for yourself. If you do take iron, I would not take very high doses of iron. I would always take maximum 50 milligrams or 20 milligrams uh, extra per day, uh, not 80 milligrams or 60 milligrams, because then there is too much risk of oxidation. But uh, yeah, iron is necessary also to yeah for a lot of functions in the body. Uh, actually, we see in some studies that iron deficiency could uh, accelerate the risk of Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease, uh, and, and too much iron can also accelerate them. But uh, I think if you stay somewhere in, in a normal range, uh, don't overdo the iron uh, and uh, don't take it intravenously, uh, 
tenderness. So, so like some doctors prescribe iron intravenously to treat severe iron deficiency. I would never do that because then, uh, yeah, the iron can really oxidize uh, a lot of uh, substances in the blood and so on. And um, so, but in general, yeah, iron is something to keep in mind, but there are many other things that are very important. Uh, a lot of people are deficient in many other substances too we already covered them uh, calcium a typical deficiency especially if you don't drink a lot of milk um which is a good thing uh, not drinking a lot of milk like i mentioned uh, magnesium about 75 percent of people in the west are deficient in magnesium um b vitamins uh, is often a deficiency vitamin d uh, so some people think well if i go into the sun now and then i have enough vitamin d well not really because the older the skin gets, the less able the skin is to convert vitamin uh, D uh, through sunlight into active vitamin D. Um, zinc is also a common deficiency. Um, uh, let's say choline or phosphatidylcholine uh, for brain health and, and epigenetic stability is also something very common. Um, so omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, huge deficiency also in the West. Uh, people don't eat four or five times per week fatty fish as they ideally should do. Uh, and then it's very difficult to get enough omega-3. And actually, I eat four or five times per week fatty fish. And uh, even I did a blood test and I was still deficient. So, uh, um, so anyway, uh, for, for omega-3 fatty deficiency, blood tests, are, are some of them can be quite accurate uh, that, uh, as an aside. But just I saying... Gonna uh, ask you that. I was going to ask you that actually a little further down. I wanted to talk about omega-3s. And um, I wanted to know why are they so beneficial? Why are they so important? I mean, eating fish four to five times a week is really hard for a majority of people. Um, some people don't eat any fish. Mm -hmm. um, why are omega-3 so important? And what are the best sources? And if we choose to supplement, how do we know it's a good supplement? And what is the difference? I mean, you look at these supplements and you've got the DHA, the EPA, how do we know how much of each of those we need or what they're even for? Yeah, these are great questions. And omega-3 fatty acids is a whole science on itself. So um, let's okay. dig into it a little bit. Um, uh, I really like the topic a lot. Um, so omega-3s are very important for brain health, heart health, uh, cardi um, uh, for eye health and so on. So they are part of the membranes of our cells. And uh, if you don't have enough omega-3, uh, yeah, the membranes, are, uh, membranes of our cells are not fluid enough. Uh, and that can create a lot of problems, uh, even arrhythmia, uh, so heart rhythm disorders or uh, how the brain cells communicate with each other. They need fluid membranes. Um, mm. Also, omega-3 is reduce inflammation uh, and they have many other functions in the body. So uh, they have epigenetic effects and so on and even are, are even needed for bone health. Uh, so not a lot of people know that omega-3s are also important for uh, healthy bones or, or to slow down osteoporosis. Um, so the problem, however, is... Um, yeah, how to get them sufficiently. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, you have different forms of omega-3 in supplements. Uh, you have the triglyceride form, which is the form we find in fish. Um, you have the phospholipid form of omega-3, which is a form you find in uh, little shrimps like krill and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a very healthy form. Um, then you have more artificial forms in some supplements. These are the ethyl ester forms of omega-3. I don't really recommend them. They are taken up better, but I, I would prefer the triglyceride form, which is the form you find in fish uh, and in algae in general. Um, so that's that's one thing. So I would try to find a supplement with the triglyceride form, uh, not the ethyl ester form of omega-3s, and, and also with phospholipid forms of omega-3s. Uh, so like you find in krill form and so on. So some supplements have a mix. Eh? They have both phospholipid omega-3 and they have triglyceride omega-3 as you find in fish. But then there is another very important form of omega-3 uh, not a lot of people know about, and that is uh, the lysophosphatidyl uh, form of omega-3. Huh? And the lysophosphatidyl form of omega-3 is a form that is very uh, well uh, capable of penetrating the brain. Mm -hmm. And it's a form you don't find that much in fish or, or in krill even. You find it mainly in fish roe. So these are the eggs of fish like caviar. Um, but uh, caviar is very expensive. It's fish roe from a specific fish. Uh, but um, I myself and what I always recommend to patients and people um, is to uh, eat fish roe regularly. 
Uh, mm -hmm. So you can buy herring roe, for example. It looks like caviar. So it's like these tiny little black little eggs. So sometimes people ask me, how many eggs do you eat per day? And I say, I eat hundreds of eggs every day because I mainly eat them through fish roe. Huh? So they are like <laughs> one spoon contains like hundreds of little eggs of, of this uh, herring. And yeah, uh, so I, I switch between herring roe and uh, lump fish roe. It's very cheap. You can also buy salmon roe. It's more expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, these eggs are more orange. Uh, very nice looking, by the way. Uh, but you can also go online, and there are some online um, websites where you can buy salmon roe, very cheap. Uh, so just saying. Uh, and if you uh, if you really want a very expensive fish roe, you can buy caviar. But it's not necessary because the lysophosphoryl form of, of those omega-3s is found in limp fish roe and in the herring roe and so on. Um, so I eat that every morning, uh, fish roe. And the, the this kind of omega-3s, uh, they can penetrate the brain very well. They can penetrate the blood-brain barrier much better than triglyceride forms of omega-3s and uh, other uh, forms of omega-3s. So they did interesting studies in, in animals where they gave triglyceride forms of DHA, uh, which is an omega-3, and then the lysophosphatidylcholine form of DHA, and that latter form got much better into the brain, uh, and the cognitive functioning of these mice improved much better uh, compared to the mice that got just a normal uh, triglyceride form uh, of omega-3. So uh, so that's one thing I want to say. Um, so what I would do is eat fish roe uh, a lot, and also eat fish every week. Uh, and of course, about fish, we can talk about the contaminants and so on. So I would eat small fish and not the big fish because you have the risk of bioaccumulation. Mm -hmm. So I would eat like uh, herring or salmon or uh, uh, mackerel or anchovy. Uh, so I eat a lot of mackerel. Uh, so every day, it's like very tasty, actually. Um, and um, yeah, and I would on top of that still take uh, omega-3 supplements. Uh, so like 1000 milligrams per day of pure omega-3, ideally both DHA and EPA, uh, which are two forms of omega-3 that uh, are important. Um, yeah. Okay. So you're telling me this row, this fish row tastes good? Sort of. Some people don't like it. So it's, it tastes like very seawatery. It's like uh, very salty. Uh, if you don't like it, so you can buy some spreads like avocado spread or uh, olive spread uh, made with olive oil. Very important. And not, uh, uh, let's say, other oils that are unhealthy, uh, like uh, uh, specific uh, uh, corn oils and, and so on and uh, sunflower oils. But ideally, uh, like uh, some sort of um, spread made with olives and olive oil. And then on top of that, you can put the uh, uh, fish roe. So that's what I eat uh, for breakfast, for example, um, uh, very regularly. Wow, I don't know that I'd want that for breakfast, but way to go. That's awesome. So when we're looking at these supplement forms, just for those of us that may supplement, does it is it going to tell us on the bottom that on the bottle that it's a triglyceride form? I mean, how are we supposed to know? Because obviously, if we're going to supplement, I guess that's the best form, but how do we know it's the triglyceride form versus the other forms? Yeah, if it's uh, mostly if it's from fish derived, is a triglyceride form. Uh, but ideally, yeah, they mentioned it also on the bottle, and you would need to look yeah, for the mentioned triglyceride. And uh, some uh, brands do uh, yeah mention that to really be very clear. Mm -hmm. But what's, what's also very important is to buy high quality omega three because a lot of omega three brands the omega three is too oxidized, mm -hmm. and that's a real big problem. Uh, so the totox value, the total oxidation value, should be very low. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you buy uh, yeah it from the stores. Uh, a lot of these omega-3s are too oxidized. And some um, brands try to camouflage that by adding uh, like uh, specific herbs uh, that uh, change the smell or taste so that you don't taste it uh, if it's, uh, that's too oxidized. But yeah, it, it's already happened eh? when the fish was harvested. Uh, it's harvested somewhere uh, before the coast of South America. Then it's shipped to China for processing. And when it's in China, it's already oxidized. And then after processing, then they add some... Uh, antioxidants to it, but then it's already way too late. So I would really choose uh, brands with low total oxidation values um, and that uh, yeah, use very purified omega-3, so no accumulation of metals and so on. Uh, mm -hmm. There are some good brands. Uh, actually, on our website, uh, novoslabs.com, I've written a whole article about the science behind omega-3s 
uh, where I also mentioned some brands. Uh, uh, so yeah, like Nordic Naturals, and uh, there is also a company in Florida that also uh, uh, has a whole team of scientists that have been devoted for decades to bring to market low oxidation uh, omega threes. So this is not sponsored, by the way, in any way possible. But just saying. Um, so these are brands I I prefer. Um, yeah, really do your homework and make mm -hmm. sure you buy a low uh, oxidized omega three and still consume fish because. In the fish, you also have so many other substances that are healthy, and not just omega-3 fatty acids, but also you have furanic fatty acids, and it's another kind of fatty acid that's also very healthy. And you do so in that sense, I would always yeah eat fish mm -hmm. uh, and uh, at least four or five times per week, and and then take a supplement uh, with low totox values on top of that, and then also regularly eat fish raw. Wow. Um, I heard something recently that I didn't realize this. Uh, should we be eating the skin on the salmon? Is the skin part healthy? I always peel that off. Yeah, me too. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, in that, that sense, I, I think it's okay. Uh, it uh, will contain a, a bit of collagen and, and some other extracellular matrix okay. substances. So it's okay, but it's not like a miracle solution. Uh, there are many uh, more important things to, uh, to follow a longevity diet, as I say. Mm -hmm. Uh, so uh, actually some people ask me what's a longevity diet and I say there are three things important very three general things that are so much more important than some other details uh, people are focusing on so the first rule of a longevity diet is to consume less meat uh, so less animal protein in general uh, um, so uh, and if you do consume animal protein, I would replace the red meat more with white meat. Um, so red meat is meat coming from cow or pigs uh, or coming from lambs or, or sheep and so on. So that red meat, replace it more with white meat coming from chickens or uh, so uh, poultry in general, uh, chicken, turkey, that kind of red meat. If you do, uh, Sorry, white meat. If you do eat animal protein, replace red meat more with white meat and fatty fish. Uh, mm. But in general, try to consume not too much animal protein and replace it more with vegetable-based uh, protein, like protein coming from legumes like beans, lentils, and so on. Um, proteins coming from broccoli or green leafy vegetables, proteins coming from nuts and, uh, and mushrooms and so on. So that's the first rule. Uh, so less animal protein. And if you do eat animal protein, white meat and fatty fish. Second rule of a longevity diet, what we see all longevity diets have in common is of course to eat less sugar. Uh, that, that's a very, that's a no brainer. Uh, so less cookies or no cookies or less soda, which is full of sugar, um, mm -hmm. less cake and, 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 and snack bars and so on. But that, that uh, everyone knows that. But what's also very important is to also eat less starchy foods uh, because starches are also carbs and uh, starches uh, so starchy foods are foods like bread potatoes pasta rice so these starchy foods we also should eat less of uh, because if you eat bread or pasta or rice it's made of starch and starch are long chains of glucose so bread and pasta and rice and potatoes are mainly still glucose it's it's mm -hmm. a long chain of glucose but still, it's it's uh, so some uh, people, if they uh, so or scientists, they studied that if you take uh, if you eat hot potatoes or uh, then you have very high sugar peaks in the blood because the starch in the in the potatoes is converted very quickly into individual glucose molecules and these enter the bloodstream and you have high uh, sugar peaks and that and those peaks accelerate aging through glycation and activation of aging pathways etc. So I would eat not just less sugars, but also less starchy foods like bread, potatoes, pasta, rice. Replace them, replace the potatoes, the pasta and rice with healthier alternatives. Uh, like you can replace them with three or four main things. So you can replace them more with legumes. Uh, you can replace them more with mushrooms and replace them more with other types of vegetable, mm -hmm. uh, vegetables. So instead of eating potato mush, you can eat broccoli mush. Mm -hmm. um, instead of pasta, just eat beans. Instead of rice, just eat mushrooms. You see, uh, it's it's very delectable and very good. I, I instead of potatoes, I mainly eat beans. For example, uh, mm -hmm. it's very it's it's very easy to make uh, and prepare, and you can add some nice um, herbs to the beans and so on and so on. So anyway, or you can use lentils or mushrooms as an alternative for potatoes, pasta, rice, and that's very important because in the West we eat way too much of those foods. Mm -hmm. I'm not against those foods. Mm -hmm. not going to say don't eat potatoes and uh, never anymore but uh, i would say we eat them way too much and the problem with potatoes pasta and rice is 
they also take away from the healthy food. If people eat potatoes, they eat less vegetables eh, or uh, and so on. So that's also a big problem. But anyway, so that's the second rule. Uh, the third rule of a longevity diet is to consume more healthy fats. So it's very important to consume more fats from olives, olive oil, fats from nuts uh, like walnuts and so on, fats from avocado, uh, fats from fatty fish, fats from chia seed and flax seed and so on. Uh, so we eat, in the West, we ate way too many carbs uh, in the form of sugars and starchy foods. Uh, we ate way too much uh, animal protein often, and we eat too little fats, healthy fats. So I, uh, I eat regularly nuts. Uh, I eat regularly uh, grains, uh, sorry, um, seeds like flax seeds, chia seeds, which are uh, full of omega-3, uh, vegetable omega-3. And uh, yeah, fats from fatty fish and avocado, olives, olive oil, and so on are great, very healthy alternatives for fat. So, uh, so what do I eat for breakfast? So that perhaps encapsulates it this a little bit. So um, for breakfast, I don't eat bread. Uh, I don't eat cereals because they're full of sugar, and uh, and what's not sugar is starch, uh, so uh, which is also essentially sugar. So for breakfast, for example, I just eat blueberries, which I thawed uh, from the night before. So I buy frozen blueberries. Before I go to bed, I put them in the refrigerator, and then the next morning they are thawed. And then I add those blueberries to a bowl. I also add pieces of avocado to the bowl that I also thawed the night before because you can buy frozen avocado that's already cut into pieces. So anyway, so so good idea. And then and then I add those uh, thawed uh, avocado pieces and these blueberries to a bowl. I add some uh, nuts to it, a little bit of dried fruit, and then I add uh, vegetable milk to it, like almond milk or cashew milk, uh, low sugar variant, and I add some slices of banana. And that's a very fast breakfast, super healthy because you have the healthy fats from the avocado. You have the super healthy carbs coming from uh, blueberries um, and uh, banana and so on. Uh, and you, you also have some healthy fats from the nuts. Mm -hmm. uh, and then after that, I take a bit of hemp protein powder to make mm -hmm. sure I've got enough protein because I think that's also a problem. I think too many people eat too many carbs. And, and they don't have enough protein, unfortunately, uh, especially if people eat more healthy food. They eat less meat, that's great, but it's important to make sure you consume enough protein. So I take uh, about 30 grams of protein, sorry, 20, 20 grams or 15 grams of uh, hemp protein in a shake. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's, and I eat a bit of dark chocolate as, as a dessert. And that's a very fast example. Uh, that's an example of a very fast and easy to prepare a super healthy breakfast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why hemp protein? I haven't heard of doing that. Yeah, I, I like hemp protein for various reasons. Um, one reason, it's, it's a vegetable-based protein. Uh, so if you do take protein, I would always recommend to take vegetable-based protein, not animal-based protein like whey protein, uh, because animal-based protein accelerates aging more, uh, uh, much more than vegetable-based protein. Uh, and uh, I can go into detail why that's the case, because some people will say, yeah, protein is protein, whether it comes from a vegetable or from meat. No, it's absolutely not the case. Uh, so there, they have done studies actually where they give rats for example the same amount of vegetable protein soy protein versus the same amount of whey protein which is an animal based milk derived protein and you see that the mice on the same amount of soy protein or rats live much longer than the rats that got uh, the whey protein uh, and the whey protein activates all kinds of aging pathways very strongly like mTOR uh, and so on but there's another discussion so I, I recommend to take always vegetable based protein and you have whey uh, so sorry as vegetable based protein you have hemp protein you have pea protein soy protein rice protein and so on but i like uh, hemp protein because it's more gentle on the stomach um uh, pea protein and rice protein and soy protein often it's, it's uh, people digest it less well uh problem uh, so anyway so i would uh, that's why i like uh, hemp protein more I heard that whey protein actually what spikes insulin. It's actually not a good choice. Is that right? Indeed, yes. It's a strong activator of all kinds of aging-related pathways, including okay. the insulin pathway, mm -hmm. um, the IGF pathway, which is the insulin-like growth factor pathway, and the mTOR pathway. Uh, mTOR stands for mammalian target of rapamycin. Mm -hmm. And if you activate those pathways, you age 
faster. Mm -hmm. And actually milk and whey protein does that very well. Uh, milk and whey protein are very strong stimulators of mTOR pathways, insulin pathways, and IGF pathways, and they accelerate aging. Actually, they have done great studies about it. Very interesting. So, for example, they give people a healthy meal and with or without a glass of milk. And if, if the people drank a glass of milk, the insulin peak was three times higher <laughs> uh, if you uh, drank a glass of milk with a meal uh, compared to not drinking uh, milk. Okay? Because the, there are all, all kinds of substances in milk that uh, activate growth pathways um, uh, because it makes sense because milk is made by nature to make calves grow very fast. Uh. So we are the only species on this planet that as an adult, still drinks milk from another animal. So it's very weird, actually. But, uh, but milk is made by nature to activate growth and activate growth pathways. But we see that those growth pathways are also aging pathways. Mm -hmm. So they really activate um, uh, aging uh, because growth and aging, they go hand in hand. Uh, so uh, insulin pathways, IGF and other growth pathways also are very well-known canonical aging pathways. Mm -hmm. I thought, you know, it would be great to talk a little bit about the aging pathways because I'm um, okay. So I know there's been like what nine or 10 different mechanisms of aging, but then there's like what three or four different pathways of aging. I mean, how do we know what we're doing or what, <laughs> what the focus is or, you know what I'm saying? It's like, that's a lot. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So um, there are nine or 10 well-known mechanisms why we age. Probably there are even more. Uh, I mean, there are anyhow any uh, more, but uh, there was a paper published a few years ago. It's called The Hallmarks of Aging. Mm -hmm. And that that paper uh, explains nine important pathways why we age. Uh, and some of these pathways are, for example, epigenetic dysregulation. Uh, we talked about it previously. Um, so this, uh, the epigenome becomes dysregulated and you have genes that are actually that should not be active and vice versa. That's one reason why we age. Um, another reason why we age is mitochondrial dysfunction. So the mitochondria are the power plants of our cells. So every cell contains on average a few hundred mitochondria. Uh, they're like very cute little organelles that create all the energy or most of the energy we need for our cells to, uh, to, to function. So they, uh, they are the power plants of our cells. And uh, when we get older, those mitochondria, they just uh, start to work less well. And that uh, causes a lot of problems, um, including feeling tired because our cells literally cannot make enough energy and, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, another reason why we age is uh, accumulation of proteins uh, inside and outside of the cells. Uh, this plays, for example, a role in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease is caused by accumulation of proteins inside and outside of the brain cells. And the brain cells, in the end, get suffocated by all this protein mess that accumulates, and they die off. Uh, uh, so you can compare it to a garbage uh, incinerator in the cells that's not working properly, and the garbage starts to accumulate. And, and, uh, and after a while, your house is full of garbage, and, uh, and there's garbage on, on your, uh, in your garden. And yeah, anyway, so your ha house collapses. So the same what happens a little bit with brain cells. And so they, they get uh, uh, buried on their own protein mess and other stuff that accumulates. Uh, so protein accumulation plays an important role in aging. And actually, that also explains uh, a little bit why high protein diets like paleo diet or Atkins okay. diet are probably not healthy in the long term because they uh, uh, accelerate this protein accumulation. Because if you consume a lot of protein, uh, you activate all kinds of pro-aging and protein accumulation pathways. But that's another discussion. But that's a nice example of how insights into aging can mm -hmm. help us much better understand which foods or diets are healthy. Because if you look on the short term, most diets work. Most diets improve your health on the short term. Like if I yeah, follow a high protein diet, I uh, my insulin improves a little bit and my uh, cholesterol goes down and I feel I lose weight. So people say, oh, great diet. But in the long term, uh, probably that kind of diet will accelerate aging. So th that's a good example of how insights into aging can help us much better assess the long-term effects of all kinds of diets. But that's another discussion. But um, another reason why we age um, is telomere attrition and telomere shortening, uh, DNA damage is another one, um, and, and also deregulated nutrient sensing. And then we come to your question, your second question you asked. Okay? You said there are these three aging mechanisms like uh, IGF uh, and insulin pathways and mTOR pathways. Mm -hmm. Well, these would belong uh, also a little bit to the nutrient sensing that gets dysregulated when we get older. So mm -hmm. our cells, when we get older, becomes less become less able 
to process the nutrients we consume. And they become less able to process the sugar. So we get diabetes and pre-diabetes and we get this accumulation of fat, uh, a beer belly, and we get these love handles uh, and we have more difficulty losing weight when we get older. Well, one reason for this is a nutri uh, nutrient deregulation in the sense that our cells become less able to uh, process and react to the nutrients we eat. Uh, and there are these pathways you mentioned, like IGF, insulin-like growth factor, uh, mm -hmm. insulin uh, itself, uh, insulin receptors, and mTOR plays an important role. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is great information. That is so good to understand. Um, I wanted to ask you, so where does fasting play? Where does Which pathways are... Um, fasting, helping and protein restriction. I mean, I, sometimes, you know, people, they don't like that, you know, the protein restriction aspect of it, because, you know, for multiple reasons, but I guess mainly is muscle mass, especially as we get older, we all know we need to have that muscle mass to prevent frailty and falls, etc. Um, so really having a basic understanding of these pathways and why we would want to say fast or restrict protein and how they're impacting these pathways to help us live longer and healthier um, as mm -hmm. opposed to not doing it. Yeah, great question. So fasting, caloric restriction, protein restriction, methionine restriction, all very fascinating ways uh, to extend lifespan, um, but I would be careful with it. Um, so uh, I, I looked a lot into this and I, I will just give you my conclusion or, or the gist, but, but also a lot of other studies uh, seem to demonstrate is the following. So for fasting, there are many different ways you can fast. Uh, and, and some people ask me, uh, what's now the best way to fast? Um, and my answer is the following. Probably the best way to fast is just to fast every three months or so for three days. So I would fast uh, every, every start of the new season uh, for three days where you uh, don't eat anything uh, and you just drink. Uh, drinking is, of course, very important. Um, and then what I would do, uh, I would try to fast during uh, sleeping. Uh, so try to fast at least, at least 12 hours uh, after your last dinner in the evening uh, and then try to not eat anything uh, anymore until the next day. So you have about a 12-hour fast. Uh, so if you eat at 7 p.m., your last food of the of the evening, I would not eat uh, anymore until 7 a.m., 12 hours later. Uh, so then you have this 12-hour window, and that's a great way to yeah to fast. Uh, and and uh, because you have all kinds of other ways of fasting, uh, where you eat in a in a specific period for only uh, you only eat in a six-hour windows or, or an eight-hour window and so on. You have alternate day fasting, so every other day you fast. But I would be careful with that because I've often seen people losing too much weight if they, for example, do alternate day fasting. You just lose too much weight, they have muscle mass declining. So I think it's a bit too intensive, uh, eating every other day nothing. Um, the problem also with that kind of uh, overly fasting is um, you become even more deficient than you probably already are in nutrients, uh, mm -hmm. like my micronutrients. So as we discussed earlier during this podcast, uh, most people are deficient already in magnesium, in potassium, in calcium, in zinc, in iron. So if they start to fast and eat like every other day uh, or eat much less, then they, they, will, they are even more likely of being deficient in, in those very important micronutrients. So uh, And they lose too much weight and muscle mass and so on. Mm -hmm. So as a solution to that, I would do like, uh, as I mentioned, try to have this 12-hour fast, perhaps get your breakfast an hour later or so uh, to add perhaps 13 hours to it. I would not skip breakfast. So about whether we should breakfast uh, have breakfast or not, I, I can talk about hours about it, but I, I will also, there are a lot of papers about this and there are a lot of confusions and contradictions about this, but to also summarize it, I think it's important to have breakfast mm -hmm. because breakfast really calibrates the body uh, for the for the whole, for the next uh, day. If, I mean, for the, all the hours following for the whole day, and uh, also during the morning, the body is most insulin sensitive and is most uh, or is best equipped to deal with sugar and uh, amino acids uh, from the protein you eat, and with, to deal with fats and so on. And actually, in the evening the body is much more insulin resistant and it's much less well equipped to deal with the food we consume. Mm -hmm. So I would always eat breakfast 
And um, I would only eat two meals per day. So I'm, for example, myself, I only eat two meals per day. I, I don't see even the youth for eating three meals per day. And anyway, I don't have time to eat uh, three meals per day. So I'm always busy. So what I do, I eat breakfast mm -hmm. and I eat a, a dinner, a small dinner. Um, and I skip lunch uh, because I don't have time. And, and ideally, it's, it's great already to consume two meals per day because mm -hmm. every meal you consume, it's really an onslaught on your body because the body has to deal with this influx of glucose which causes oxidative stress it has to deal with this influx of amino acids with this influx of uh, of fats uh, which are very difficult to process because fats and water don't mix well together so they tend to accumulate everywhere so every meal causes a lot of oxidative stress uh, inflammation it causes uh, lipotoxicity and so on so if you can just reduce your amount of meals from two uh, from three meals per day to two meals, that's already great. Uh, and um, and then I would include breakfast. Uh, why? Because uh, also other studies show that if you eat more in the morning and uh, uh, earlier in the day, you are much healthier uh, than when you eat the same amount of calories and actually exactly the same foods later in the day. Mm -hmm. So this also shows that it's best to eat as, uh, in the morning. Uh. Of course, if you have breakfast, you cannot really fast until lunch, uh, until midday. Mm -hmm. uh, like if you want to do a 16 hour fast or so, but I, I think the, uh, as I, uh, I really thought a lot about this. And so, uh, and I read a lot of stuff about it. So I think the best way is really um, to do the 12 hour fast. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so make sure you don't eat anything after you have had dinner and try to fast until the next day. Uh, eat perhaps your breakfast one hour or so or two hours later, but do bre have breakfast because your body is best well, uh, equipped to deal with all uh, with all, all these kinds of foods. Don't eat lunch uh, or eat something very small in the afternoon, uh, some nuts or or, uh, or uh, a bit of fruit or some dark chocolate uh, to uh, curb the munchies. By the way, if you're hungry, nuts work like a charm to suppress yeah. hunger. Uh, so I often eat a, a mix of nuts with a little bit of chocolate or with some uh, with a banana or even a little bit of dried fruit mm -hmm. uh, mixed with the nuts um, and uh, and so on. And then I have my second meal in the evening. And actually, I see a lot of people who are like very old old and still very healthy the, what they all have in common is that they eat mostly two meals per day uh, even david sinclair who is a, an authority on aging uh, and who, whose work we follow very closely he also only eat two hours per day and like i said uh, often i encounter people who look very young for their age and what they often have, have in common is they don't eat three meals per day and and what I then would do on top of that is fast every three months uh, uh, because we see that because for three days, why three days? Well, it's only after two days that all kinds of mechanisms uh, kick into action that you don't have when you fast only for 12 hours or 16 hours. Mm -hmm. So after two days, you really get ketosis uh, starts going and uh, you uh, autophagy is uh, much uh, more upregulated than when you fast for shorter terms. Um, you will see stem cell renewal after two, three days. Mm -hmm. um, so you have all these extra benefits you don't have when you do a shorter fast, but shorter fasts are also still healthy. But that's why I would do a three-day fast every three months, uh, three months. And what I would then recommend to do when you really do that real fast uh, for three uh, three days um, is to uh, to still uh, take caprylic acids and electrolytes during the fasting. So electrolytes means taking calcium, potassium. Uh, sodium and magnesium during the fast because these electrolytes are important mm -hmm. and to take perhaps a little bit of caprylic acid which is a, a, a medium chained uh, fat that is very healthy for the brain and uh, because otherwise you have perhaps too much muscle breakdown and, and some people they just suffer too much and uh, but I've, I've written a whole article on how to the best way to fast uh, okay. on our website novoslabs.com uh, where we explain uh, yeah the whole, all the details because it's a complicated uh, topic mm -hmm. yeah do you like mix in like liquid electrolytes uh, yes yes i drink them in water uh, or tea when i fast so i add a, a bit of potassium sodium uh, magnesium and calcium twice uh, or three times per day i drink them with water or my tea when i fast and then i um I also eat uh, three tablespoons of caprylic acid in the morning, in the okay. midday and the evening when I fast. Um, and it also helps you to enter ketosis faster. Uh, in many cases, uh, the caprylic acid. 
You can buy bottles of them on Amazon.com and uh, of Caprilic. pure caprylic acid. Okay, so it's like something you scoop out or you... Yeah, it's a bottle. Uh, it's, it's liquid. Uh, so you just uh, uh, yeah, pour it into a tablespoon and uh, you just consume it. Uh, it. It is a bit of calories. Okay. Uh, but it's not really breaking your fast and it makes the fast more, let's say, uh, bearable uh, in, in that sense. But it's not necessary uh, if you don't want to take the caprylic acid. It's okay, but it's, I would advise to take at least the electrolytes. Wow. Great information. Thank you so much for sharing that. I also follow that method. I go ahead and have breakfast. I have a similar breakfast to you. I mean, I don't eat the fish roe, but I definitely have berries and nuts every single day. And I, I believe that I've read the studies as well. And I believe it's better to eat earlier rather than later and have less, less food overall in general, but definitely two meals a day. Um, as far as longevity, I know for a lot of people, it sounds like a way, it's a ways off, right? We don't have to worry about that till later. When do you feel is really necessary to start making these lifestyle interventions um, to prevent not only just, you know, prevent diseases in the later years where most of us at the end of our life, um, we have all these different diseases. So when do you feel it's necessary to really start getting serious about these lifestyle changes? Yeah, to answer that question, I have to make the distinction between longevity supplements and health supplements. But before I do that, we first need to ask ourselves the question, when do we start to age? Because I would say we, we would start to we would need to deal with aging as soon as we start to age. But when uh, do we start to age? There's, uh, there's some discussions, uh, at least uh, for some people about it. And some people say we age when we see the first symptoms of aging, like the first gray hairs and the first um, wrinkles around the eye and, and, and so on and the mouth uh, when we are in our 30s, for example. Uh, mm -hmm. But that's not really when we start to age. Uh, we start to age sooner. And a lot of scientists believe we start to age when we hit puberty. Because you see then after puberty, the mortality risk really skyrockets. Uh, so it doubles every eight years uh, uh, after puberty. It makes sense because uh, sex and, and sex hormones are very related to lifespan. Uh, so some animals or organisms in nature are immortal. And that's one of the reasons is because they reproduce uh, asexually. So anyway, sex and aging are very closely intertwined. So it makes sense that when puberty kicks in, when we are around 14, 15 years, we really start to age. Um, but then it takes at least 10, 15 years before you see the first symptoms of aging. Eh? So you're mostly you're, in, you're 25 when you see the first crow feeds around your eye, or you're 30 when you get the first gray hairs, because these processes take time. Huh? So what I would recommend is to start to uh, address aging yeah, after puberty. Yeah? So when you're like 17, 18 years, uh, and when, when you're fully grown, sort of. Uh, so I would start around your 20s uh, to deal with aging, to take longevity supplements, for example, which are substances that have shown to extend lifespan in multiple species and that act on aging, uh, fundamental aging mechanisms. Mm -hmm. So these are longevity supplements like alpha ketoglutarate, microdose lithium, fisetine, pterostilbean, um, so so uh, glucosamine. Uh, these are like supplements that have shown to extend lifespan and uh, can uh, reduce mortality, for example, in humans. But, but then besides these longevity supplements, that act on fundamental aging mechanisms, you also have health supplements. And these are vitamins and minerals uh, often, uh, or micronutrients in general. So these are things like magnesium, vitamin D, uh, omega-3s, uh, uh, zinc, iron, etc. So these are substances you need for proper functioning. And uh, these are health supplements. But a lot of studies show that if you take extra of these health supplements, you're not really going to extend maximum lifespan. Uh, uh, so if you take extra uh, B vitamins uh, or you take extra uh, uh, zinc or so, uh, you're, you're not really going to, or extra omega-3, you're not really going to extend maximum lifespan. But if you are deficient in them, you shorten lifespan. You see, because you need those health supplements for optimal longevity. And I would start to take them already when you're very young. 
because everyone needs magnesium, omega-3 fatty acids, vitamin D. Children, we have seen in studies, if you give children vitamin D, they have much less risk of getting uh, autoimmune diseases like type 1 diabetes or multiple sclerosis. Uh, if you give children uh, B vitamins and omega-3s, they have better brain development. If you give them magnesium and, and potassium and calcium, uh, they, they are more calmer and then they have uh, uh, less uh, hyperactivation and so on. So I think these health supplements, the sooner you start with them, the better, even if you're a child, because everyone needs them for proper normal functioning. And most people are unfortunately deficient in them because the way our Western diet is a far cry from what it used to be. And actually what it used to be was also not a perfect diet either because nature didn't make people to absorb all nutrients properly. That's, there's another discussion, but some people say, do, why do I need supplements? Uh, because uh, if I eat healthy, I don't need supplements. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions out there because nature didn't make our body to absorb all micronutrients for a long, healthy lifespan because nature actually didn't care for us to live long enough uh, or to become very old. Mm -hmm. And nature just cares about get, uh, reproducing ourselves as soon as possible before we die of external causes of deaths. But, uh, and, and iron deficiency and iodine deficiency have plagued humanity for thousands and thousands of years. Uh, so there's a misconception that even in prehistoric times, people uh, yeah, were not micronutrient uh, deficient. They, they were uh, uh, very likely in most cases. So anyway, so to answer your question, in a nutshell, um, I would... When uh, already when you're a child, I would take health supplements like vitamins, minerals, omega-3, and so on. Mm -hmm. And when you're around uh, 18 or 20, I would start to really look into longevity supplements to act on the aging process itself and uh, slow it down. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, combine already since a young age, yeah, make sure you exercise well, you sleep well, you have stress reduction, because all those things also accelerate aging, of course. Mm -hmm. You mentioned iodine, and I thought I would just mention uh, or ask you. Um, my actual functional nurse practitioner wants me to take it for breast health. Breast, uh, apparently, there's been a big correlation with iodine deficiency in breast cancer. Um, but my question is if I'm taking these iodine supplements, is this going to put me at risk for maybe thyroid cancer? I mean, that was just something I was thinking about. Um, you know, what do you mm -hmm. think about something like that? Yeah, iodine is a super interesting topic. And there are also a lot of misconceptions out there. Um, still, unfortunately, also doctors are not very well trained in it, uh, unfortunately. So um, yeah, where to begin? But let me put it that way. So I believe that iodine is an important supplement for health and longevity. And I think a lot of people are iodine deficient. Uh, and you can, it's very difficult to track it in the blood. Uh, so mostly doctors will measure TSH, uh, thyroid stimulating hormone, to determine iodine deficiency or to determine thyroid gland malfunction. Well, it's a very bad biomarker. Uh, so TSH levels, first of all, they fluctuate a lot during the day. Uh, secondly, they're just very bad to track iron deficiency. Uh, but that's how it goes. Uh, so most people just look at TSA, they say it's normal. So uh, I don't need iodine or, or uh, my uh, thyroid gland is in order. Um, a second problem is that even the values that we currently have for TSA are not adequate. Uh, so some people say there's a problem when uh, the TSA levels are higher than four. But other doctors and scientists say, no, they should be at uh, two. Uh, so it's, you already have a problem when it's higher than two. Uh, and some people say it should be even uh, lower. Uh, um, but in most lab tests and most hospitals, it's a four or five. And then you, you're uh, allegedly tyra, uh, then you have a, a thyroid disorder. Um, so that, that's another problem. And uh, the values, uh, uh, they are also not let's say you should not interpret them very strictly, but even then it's just a very crude biomarker of iodine deficiency and thyroid function. I think most people are iodine deficient if they don't regularly eat seaweed or take iodine supplements. Uh, seaweed contains a lot of iodine. Actually, I would not recommend it because it sometimes contains too much iodine. And so if you eat seaweed, you have uncontrolled, very high iodine peaks, which is also not good for your thyroid gland. So your thyroid gland doesn't like high peaks of iodine. So I would be careful with seaweed and seaweed supplements because the doses are not uh, well regulated and the same always and too high. Um, so, but I think, like I mentioned, I think most people are iodine deficient despite uh, having normal iodine levels. And, I, and like I said, if you don't eat seaweed or take iodine supplements, it's very, very likely you're iodine deficient. Mm. And um, the, what I, a second thing I would like to add 
is that the recommendations of uh, the doses of iodine are too low. Um, mm -hmm. Our governments often determine doses of vitamins and minerals uh, in very crude ways. Uh, so that's the minimum dose you need not to become very ill in a very short time. But that doesn't say anything about the ideal dose uh, mm -hmm. because governments, they don't, they don't bother to test for decades uh, to see what happens uh, if you take that dose. So you just look at short-term studies, mm -hmm. sometimes even no studies. So sometimes you just say, yeah, you need that dose because that's the amount most people take. So that's what you apparently perhaps need. But that doesn't say anything about the optimal levels. If everyone takes too little, perhaps that's not enough. But anyway, so I can talk for hours about that too. But just take the government recommendations, those doses, with also a grain of potassium salt. Um, so what I uh, do, I take uh, eight to ten times more iodine every day than what the governments recommend. So governments recommend 150 okay. microgram uh, per day of iodine. I take one milligram or, or thousand microgram of iodine uh, through supplements. I take iodine and iodide. So the mix, not just iodine. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's very important. And um, uh, what I, for example, noticed previously, I took the same uh, amount of iodine that governments recommend, 150 micrograms. Didn't feel anything. But when I start taking thousand micrograms of iodine per day, uh, for the first time, my hands were warm again. And my feet, so I always had cold feet when I was a child. Uh, I could concentrate much better. I had more energy. I always have a lot of brain energy, but even more. Huh? So, <laughs> uh, And also very remarkable, I could remember my dreams again. So I stopped to remember my dreams when I, since age eight or so, since I was very young. And yeah, for many, many years, I never re remember my dreams. But when taking iodine, uh, high dose iodine, I yeah, re remember my dreams much better. So, um, and we see iodine is important for brain function, uh, for breast health. So a lot of women actually have cysts, cysts in their breasts. Mm -hmm. And a great treatment for uh, cysts, uh, these kinds of cysts is taking high dose of iodine. Um, I would not take super high doses. So some people take um, 10 or 20 milligrams of iodine. I would just err at the side of caution. Uh, so I would take one uh, milligram, a thousand micrograms of iodine. Um, if you look at some uh, regions in Okinawa, in Japan, they consume up to two or three uh, milligrams of iodine per day. I, I would recommend to take one, just two milligram of iodine per day, which is thousand micrograms per day. But yeah, you have some people taking 10, 20 milligrams of iodine per day. That's a bit, I think it could be perhaps too much. But um, uh, anyway, but it's a great way to treat cystic prep, uh, um, the cysts in, in breasts also. And um, yeah, iodine is also important for blood vessel health and metabolism and, and, and so on. And it's important to take a high enough dose. Yeah. Do you take it in the morning and do you take it with food? I take it in the morning. Yeah, because it also gives more energy. Um, so, uh, yeah, I would uh, take it in the morning um, and I take other stuff in the morning that also gives me energy like B vitamins. So I take a B vitamin complex. So you should not take it in the evening because uh, it gives energy and it can interfere with sleep if you take it in the evening. Um, okay. So, yeah. Uh, and also I take uh, Novos, the supplement. It contains a lot of substances uh, that are very uh, that they also give energy and that also have shown to extend lifespan, uh, like rhodiola rosea. Uh, it extends lifespan in multiple species, but it also gives energy. Um, so magnesium malate, uh, so magnesium uh, gives energy and malate too. Uh, Tianin also has shown to extend lifespan, uh, but it also uh, provides more focus and concentration. Uh, so there are a lot of interesting substances that uh, have longevity effects, but also can provide energy and concentration and so on. Mm -hmm. Do you take NMN? Yes, definitely. Yeah, so NMN is an interesting molecule. Um, it's an NAD booster. So mm -hmm. NAD is an important molecule that, that all our cells need to function properly. Um, it's involved in many different cellular processes. And when we get older, NAD levels decline. And substances like NMN boost NAD. Uh, so they help uh, the cells to have more energy to carry out their uh, functions. Mm -hmm. So I do take NMN uh, every day. Yeah, so uh, around three uh, to 400 milligrams per day. Mm -hmm. And there are studies showing that uh, NMN can mitigate all kinds of aging effects in old mice. So if old mice get NMN, 
they have more energy, they perform better, they have less uh, insulin resistance, uh, their eye health improves, and so on. And also, uh, recently, we have seen studies in humans, if you give uh, elderly uh, people and a man, uh, their metabolism improves or and their stamina improves. Uh, if you give a uh, woman who are uh, obese or pre-diabetic uh, and a man improves insulin sensitivity. So it's uh, definitely an interesting substance. I think David Sinclair said he gives his 80 year old dad M and then he's golfing and has amazing energy. It's so interesting. Definitely. Yes, indeed. And, but you need to combine it ideally with other substances. So um, I, I don't believe in a magic uh, bullet for aging. Uh, so you have people saying NMN is great, spermidine is great, uh, fisetin is great. Yes, they're all great, but ideally you combine them. And I think that's very important. Uh, mm -hmm. there, there's no real magic bullet and you have a lot of synergy when combining uh, different ingredients. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why we created our, our longevity supplement, Novo Score. It mm -hmm. contains 12 ingredients, 12 in our view of the most science based ingredients to tackle aging. And uh, so it contains substances like uh, glucosamine, um, uh, microdose lithium, phycetin, pterostilbene, um, and uh, many other very interesting substances, alpha ketoglutarate, glycine, uh, malate. Uh, all these substances have a lot of great science behind them. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, they work synergistically. And I think, uh, yeah, that's very important. Uh, no, not just taking one or two supplements uh, is going to make a big dent in the aging process, unfortunately. I was worried about taking MNN just out of fear of possible cancer growth. Have you heard that or researched that at all? Yes, definitely. Um, yeah, where to start? So let's me see. Uh, there, is a, there are a lot of misconceptions about NMN and cancer online. Um, so there is no study showing that NMN causes cancer. Uh, actually, it could reduce the risk of cancer because NMN stabilizes the genome. It uh, helps to maintain the epigenome. And we see that mutations in the DNA or the genome cause cancer and mutations in the epigenome also cause cancer. Um, so actually, it could uh, reduce the risk of cancer. But if you already have cancer, then perhaps NMN could accelerate cancer growth, just like a lot of other healthy substances. Mm -hmm. Because what's healthy for normal cells is also healthy for cancer cells. Because mm -hmm. cancer cells are your own cells that uh, yeah, have, uh, have uncontrolled growth, and you just keep dividing. So a lot of substances actually can accelerate cancer growth which are healthy, like uh, B vitamins, uh, like folate or, or folic acid. Uh, that's a B vitamin. If you give, uh, if you already have cancer and you take B vitamins or zinc or iron or even glucose or um, or amino acids, yeah, you can accelerate cancer growth because these cancer cells need uh, folate and they need uh, sugar and they need zinc and they need iron uh, and they need NMN to grow. You see, so um, so if you already have cancer. I would be careful with taking uh, B vitamins and zinc and, and others uh, and uh, NMN uh, because, yeah, uh, it could theoretically accelerate the cancer growth. But you want to prevent cancer in the first place. Okay. So if you don't have cancer, uh, NMN, it's, it's safe, uh, just like B vitamins and uh, zinc and other stuff um, in that regard. So that's where the, uh, the misconception often comes uh in, in in that regard so uh, and a man could actually protect against cancer and and extend lifespan uh in, in uh, including uh yeah reducing the risk of uh, organisms to die of uh, to die from cancer mm. thank you for clearing that up do you take that in the morning then and do you take it with food yeah i take it in the morning after my breakfast so uh yeah Okay. And some people say, yeah, should I uh, take NMN with methyl donors? Uh, because the way the NMN is processed, uh, it can consume some methyl groups. And uh, remember, the methyl groups are the little molecules mm -hmm. that are put onto the DNA to silence genes. So they play an important role in, in uh, epigenetic health. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, the methyl groups are also needed in many other uh, fun for many other functions of the cells. Um, and NAD, or if you take NMN, uh, you could deplete perhaps uh, methyl groups. Uh, mm -hmm. And just to be sure, I, I always take it with B vitamins because the B vitamins improve methylation and some of them are methyl donors. Uh, and I also take phosphatidylcholine. 
uh, which is uh, contains choline. It's also a donor of uh, of uh, of methyl groups. Uh, so if you you can combine your NMN with B vitamins and phosphatidylcholine, for example, uh, yeah, to further improve the synergy and uh, and the effect of uh, the positive effect of NMN. Is there certain foods or that we can add help us add methyl groups and can we add too many methyl groups? Yeah, well, there, there is there are, there are foods that are healthy for our epigenome, um, um, but yeah, often it's it's not easy to find uh, the methyl groups uh, in, in that sense. Uh, you can consume green leafy vegetables; they are very healthy. Um, and uh, yeah, you have some uh, fruits and and, uh, and 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 legumes and mushrooms and uh, often healthy foods can improve methylation. Uh, some herbs even also have epigenetic effects. Uh, so that's definitely a way to go forward. Uh, but I would also take supplements on top of that because even if you eat healthy, it's very difficult to get all the micronutrients uh, you need. Uh, that's also a whole discussion. So, uh, But actually, I see a lot of people if they eat healthy, more plant-based and, and so on, actually they're more at more risk of, of having deficiencies. And I can understand there is like a whole debate between People who love to eat meat and have a carnivorous diet versus more plant-based people, mm -hmm. and they can they they have all these very tense discussions, and I can understand both sides because if you eat plant-based, sometimes yeah or quite often you become deficient in all kinds of stuff you mainly find more in a meat-based diet eh, like iron and um, choline and omega threes from fatty fish and uh, B vitamins and so and zinc and and, and carnitine and carnosine in and so on and 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 uh so that's why some meat eaters or carnivorous diet proponents they say when i switch from my vegetable or a more vegetarian based diet to a meat diet i feel much better yes they do but they probably age much faster too right? so that's another problem um so i think a more plant-based diet is indeed better if you really correct for the deficiencies, you are at a much higher risk of, of getting. Uh, uh, and it's very complicated discussion, actually. Uh, but uh, I would propose a more plant-based diet, as I, uh, as I uh, said, but still eat white meat and fatty fish and take supplements. Because even if you eat healthy, it's impossible to get all the uh, micronutrients. So if you eat healthy, it's almost impossible to get vitamin D. Huh? And you can get it from the sun, but in the winter um, and so on, uh, it's also not ideal. Uh, even if you eat healthy, where are you going to get your iodine? Right? Um, you find it a little bit in eggs and, and, and seaweed, but uh, a lot, but I would not recommend to eat seaweed, but most people don't eat seaweed. So even, so they are iodine deficient. Um, they, they are deficient in many other substances um, like iron and zinc often uh, and carnitine and so on. So I would then just supplement. And I think the best diet for longevity is a more plant-based diet with supplementation. Uh, I think that really uh, you have the benefits of a meat-based diet because you supplement with vitamin B12 and other substances that are needed. And, and you have the advantages of a plant-based diet. What about eggs? Don't, don't eat eggs? Eggs, I think, yeah, they, they are also uh, okay. Uh, I would okay. not overdo it, So, okay. but I think a few eggs per week are excellent. They are full of okay. choline and other healthy substances. Uh, you have people eating four eggs every day. I think there's always a problem with nutrition advice. Uh, the pendulum swings uh, way too far in the other direction, you see. So um, I, I think eggs are quite healthy, but don't overdo it. Uh, uh, if it's still a it's still an uh, animal based food, mm -hmm. and if you eat like really a lot of them, like every day, uh, multiple eggs, um, it changes the microbiome, for example, and it can stiffen the arteries and mm -hmm. and so on. So I would not. Uh, it's very complicated nutrition. So um, often, what I learned in my experience is not to go overboard. You have always so many extremes. Uh, you have people saying. Uh, animal protein is great and they go on paleo or keto diets and they eat a lot of fats uh, or they eat a lot of animal protein they, um, and, uh, or people think, saying eggs are healthy and they eat every morning four eggs. I, I think best is to be a little bit in moderation, uh, but I don't want to uh, become like governments as, uh, because their moderation is way, uh, their advice is often not very effective uh, uh, and uh, there is a lot of improvement there. But what I would do is Everyone is a little bit right. We should eat more healthy fats. So the keto diet proponents are right. 
uh, about animal protein, yeah, we ideally we have to be careful we're not protein deficient. So get your protein from white meat and fatty fish. Uh, the egg proponents, yeah, you can eat a couple of eggs per week, but not uh, four eggs every day. Mm -hmm. uh, try to find the middle ground a little bit. In general, I would just summarize it as consume more healthy fats, consume less animal protein. If you do it, more white meat or fatty fish and consume more healthy carbs uh, from uh, vegetables, from pulses, from mushrooms, and so on. So that's, uh, and, and add to that uh, supplements, health supplements, and longevity supplements. Uh, because even if you eat healthy, you will be very likely deficient, especially when you get older and your gut and stomach absorbs these nutrients much less well and so on. Of all the aging mechanisms, what, what would you say is, your, uh, is the most important one and what are the things besides diet that we should be doing to impact it? Yeah, the most important one, I think, is epigenetic dysregulation. Uh, so I, there are many reasons why uh, perhaps epigenetic dysregulation is the most important reason why we age. Uh, there are many other reasons why we age. But um, yeah, one is, for example, we see in studies that if you reprogram the epigenome, you can make old organisms younger again. Uh, so there's a strong indicator that the epigenome plays an important role in aging. Also, as I mentioned before, we have all these different kinds of cells in our body. And they have the same genome, they have the same DNA, but a brain cell can become 80 years old while a skin cell only becomes four weeks old. Uh, so, but they have the same genome. So why does a skin cell ages much, much faster? Well, it's because of the epigenome. Uh, mm -hmm. So the epigenome makes brain cells uh, able to live for eight years. And the epigenome makes a skin cell only big, uh, yeah, age very quickly and only live for about four weeks. Mm -hmm. um, another reason is in nature. Uh, you have like bees and queen bees, like bees only live for a few weeks, uh, worker bees. And the queen bee who has the same uh, uh, genome as the worker bees, the queen bee can live up to many years. Mm -hmm. And why is that? Because the epigenome. Uh, so a worker bee, when it's a larva, a larva, it gets fed with royal jelly, and the royal jelly epigenetically reprograms the larva so that the uh, the worker bee becomes a queen bee that lives for five years, while uh, normally a worker bee would only live for a few weeks, and that's because of uh, the epigenetic uh, uh, regulation. Mm -hmm. uh, because, because they have the same genome, they have the same DNA, but their lifespans are drastically different. So anyway, I can talk for many hours why I think the epigenome is better, uh, more interesting, or the most interesting biomarker uh, hit her to. Um, and uh, the second question is, uh, what can we do other than food to live longer? Well, uh, many things. Uh, exercise, of course, is very important. Um, strength exercise, like with weights, and also endurance exercise, like running or walking or dancing, uh, some more aerobic exercise. Uh, you can also do high in, uh, hit high intensity interval training where you really exercise a lot for one minute and take a break and then exercise again a lot for one minute. Mm -hmm. uh, so that these are great ways of exercise. We would also do posture training to improve your posture. Very important for blood circulation, uh, stretching, and and, uh, and so on. Um, another thing very important for longevity is sleep optimization. So I think uh, for a lot of people, their sleep is a mess. So I really would try to get to bed at the same time. Make sure you have like like around eight hours of sleep. Um, I Like I mentioned before on our website, novoslabs.com, we have like 50 tips to sleep better. Um, so I'm a sleep hacker myself. I have uh, goggles that uh, shine blue light. Uh, I was looking about they were on my desk, but they aren't. But anyway, so every morning I shine blue light into my eyes for 20 minutes uh, to uh, regulate my circadian rhythm because there are studies showing in the morning, if you're exposed to blue light, you sleep much better in the evening. Uh, you can also go outside and, and walk, but uh, you, you cannot always go outside. At least um, I have to work. Uh, I'm always busy. So anyway, so I don't have time always to, to yeah. uh, go outside in the morning. So, so that's why I bought the glasses. Uh, in the evening, I use blue light blocking glasses. So the, you can buy them. They cost like 10 euros or $10. Uh, and they just block the blue light coming from your screen and the uh, lamps around you in the evening. And if you put them up after 30 minutes, you really start to feel tired. Oh. Mm. So, uh, and I have like uh, a ring, this ring, it's called the Aura Ring, which tracks my sleep, my heart rate variability and uh, uh, heart rate and so on during sleep. Um, and uh, yeah, so there are great ways. I also have a, another little device. That's, uh, that's actually here on my desk, uh, 
uh, that really sends uh, vibrations uh, uh, at the back of my ear uh, to calm down. And also when I, before I go to bed, I put it on and uh, it's 20 minutes of uh, vibrations. Uh, and they also have done uh, clinical trials with this device. Uh, so showing, uh, I think Stephen Harvard uh, sponsored um, the, or done in Harvard um, about this device that it improves also relaxation and so on. So there are many ways to improve your sleep. And I think that's very important for longevity too. Um, I think stress reduction, very important to meditate. So I meditate uh, and um, that's important too, to reduce stress. Also important happiness. So what a lot of centenarians have in common, I must say, so these are people who are become very old or, uh, or people who become like 80, 90 years and still in very good shape. What they often in, have in common is that they're very optimistic. So they are like very cheerful people. They can tell about uh, terrible things they witnessed or uh, underwent during the Second World War, for example. And then they tell a terrible story and then they say, mm, yeah, well, life goes on and, uh, I'm, uh, and I'm very happy and, they, and they, they love a little bit about it. So they, they have this ability to put things into perspective, to always look at the silver lining of things, uh, even in the most dire situation, to still look for an optimistic aspect to it. Um, and, and they don't take themselves too seriously. And uh, yeah, I think that also goes a long way for optimal health and, uh, and longevity. Mm. Um, what was the name of that device real quick? Yeah, so the, the little device, um, it, uh, it's, it's uh, called now, I, I have to think about it. So I always forget the, the name of it. Um, so I, I have it here. Okay. But it, it's, um, uh, it's a little device. Let me quickly uh, look at my app. Uh, there it has the name of uh, the device. Yeah, sorry, it's Cove. So um, you can cut this away. So I will redo it. So the little device, it's called uh, Cove. Um, and that's, uh, yeah, that has some signs, but there are other relaxation devices out there. And, uh, yeah, so, uh, I would opt for the ones that have undergone, uh, clinical trials, okay. uh, that really have shown uh, benefit, uh, with, uh, ideally some placebo controlled, uh, groups. Okay. Awesome information. Thank you so much. If there was one piece of advice that you, that people could start doing today, what would it be? Yeah, I think the best way to live longer is your nutrition. So what you eat, when you eat, how you eat, that's the best thing we have for longevity. It's the most important determinant of longevity. So the best technology we have to live longer is our diet. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be the first thing I would uh, try to change. Eat a healthy longevity diet, uh, uh, use supplements, health supplements and longevity supplements. Uh, because it's a mistake to think if I eat healthy, I don't need supplements. And that's where I, where I would start. Uh, definitely. Awesome. All right. Well, where can everybody follow what you're doing and what no, what's going on with Novos Labs? Where can we find you? Yeah, well, uh, I have a website, just uh, christopherberg.com. Um, I also have a Twitter account. Oh, sorry, uh, yeah, I do have a Twitter account, but I also have an Instagram account. Just my name, Chris with a K, Verberg, G H at the end. Um, and we also, I've also written a book. I've written multiple books, but I think a, a lot of what we told, uh, spoke about here um, is you can find it also in my book. It's called The Longevity Code. Uh, you can find it now on Amazon. And that book, uh, yeah, it, it's the first book actually that combined nutrition advice with uh, biotech to live longer. Uh, mm -hmm. So there you find a lot of practical advice to live longer, healthier lives. Mm -hmm. And you also can go to our website, novoslabs.com, where you find uh, a lot of information to live longer, healthier lives. So we really want to be a platform for uh, people to live longer. And so we uh, give out a lot of information, uh, tips to uh, improve your nutrition to live longer, your sleep to live longer, which are the best wearables, which are the best gadgets, uh, which are the best tests you can do, blood tests and so on. Uh, so we really want to help people uh, to live longer, healthier lives uh, mm -hmm. through our website in a very science-based, evidence-based and data-driven way. Mm -hmm. I love your website. I know I've shared multiple articles from it. And what I love about it is a lot of the information you're giving isn't because they sponsor you or you're, co you know, collaborating with them. It's just free advice. I love the article. You give a huge article on longevity where you actually go through all these supplements you've talked about and you give 
brand and certain recommendations that you aren't necessarily being sponsored with. That's a big deal. Yeah, we don't sponsor any brand we mention on the websites. Uh, so um, in, in that regard, we really want to be impartial because longevity is our passion. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, me as a medical doctor, the best way I can help as many people as possible is not having a, a private practice and seeing one patient every uh, two hours, because if you really want to uh, explain longevity, it takes at least two hours. No, I really want to have thousands of people. And that's why we give all this advice away for free, uh, like a, a top longevity doctor would do. And they are very hard to come by, to be honest. Um, and yeah, it's our passion. So we really want to share it with people. We think it's very important um, to slow down aging because it's the best way to stay healthy and reduce the risk of heart disease, Alzheimer's disease, cancer, and so on. And it's just super interesting. So that's why we uh, put it out there for everyone to read and enjoy and uh, to implement. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Thank you so much for being here. It's been an awesome conversation. You've shared so much value. And um, I just wish you the best of luck with everything. And hopefully we get a chance to talk again soon. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you. I really enjoyed uh, the conversation and the great yeah. questions. So thank yeah. you for having me and wishing you the best of health. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Same to you. Take care. Thank you.